As a model for the philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein chose to quote a line from Nestroy's play Der Schützling, The Protégé. <coughs> the main point about progress is that it always seems greater than it really is. Überhaupt hat der Fortschritt das an sich, dass er viel größer ausschaut, als er wirklich ist. The structure and content of this paper reflect how I see the motto of the investigations orienting the reader towards the remainder of the text, specifically prefiguring how the concept of progress is relevant for our grasping some of its central philosophical <coughs> terms. I see the motto as at once referring us to Wittgenstein's authorship and at the same time referring to the cultural context in which his work has been carried out. My main aim in this paper, then, is to give an account of how I see the philosophical investigations engaging in a critique of a certain understanding of progress in a cultural sense of that term against the background of the way in which I understand the book to amount to a kind of philosophical progress in Wittgenstein's thinking. And I should make clear that I do not assume that any of the interpreters of Wittgenstein, many of whom are present, whose work has been most influential for my thinking about the philosophical relation between the Tractatus and the investigations would endorse the methods or conclusions of my paper. My primary aim here can perhaps be made a bit clearer by calling attention to an ambiguity in my title. The concept of progress in Wittgenstein's thought can be understood to refer to certain features of the development of his thought. But it could also be taken to refer to what Wittgenstein thought about the concept of progress, where concept of progress is connected to certain value judgments one makes when comparing different features of earlier and later historical periods. The main goal of this paper, then, is to show how it broadens our perspective on the nature and significance of Wittgenstein's philosophy when we see that these two ways of thinking about the role of progress in his thought are actually woven together in his work. A further challenge follows from the way I try to reach this goal, since the paper draws on and brings together what to some may seem to be not only individually controversial, but also incompatible approaches to understanding Wittgenstein's, Wittgenstein's thought as that is expressed in his text. And this last sentence refers to the possibility that some readers may think that my reading tries to accommodate both a so-called text imminent approach with a so-called genetic or contextualist approach, where it is assumed that these terms signal approaches to texts that must be mutually exclusive. In part one, I note some assumptions, and I want to un underscore that, assumptions I make regarding the relation between the Tractatus and the investigation. Against the background of these assumptions, I show in part two how the remarks on rule following can be taken as an example of how the philosophical investigations attempts to lead the reader to a perspective on language that is directly relevant for a type of philosophical critique of culture. Part three begins with a discussion of some textual and literary critical questions that bear on the nature of the motto, as well as on the use I make of material that not only falls outside of philosophical investigations, but outside of anything we might call Wittgenstein's strictly philosophical texts. The main goal of my discussion there is to connect the perspective that I claim to locate in my discussion of the remarks on the rule problem with Wittgenstein's views on modern civilization, <coughs> especially as these pertain to a critique of the concept of progress. Finally, in part four, I discuss how these considerations can deepen our understanding of how the philosophical investigations is progress over the Tractatus. I maintain that while the perspective on humanity and so on modernity, to which each of these books attempts to lead its reader, is essentially the same, the earlier work is thwarted in this endeavor by the metaphysical commitments implicit in its philosophical treatment of language. Wittgenstein's placing of the quotation from Nestroy's play at the beginning of his book can reasonably be taken as intended to guide the reader's attention into more than one channel of thought. And I say here, it's clear that Wittgenstein's placing of such a passage at the beginning of his book uh, can reasonably be taken as pointing the reader in several directions at once. And I don't pretend here to give some sort of exhaustive list or discussion of the ways in which the motto may be functioning. 
In particular, David Stern suggests further, beyond what I discuss here, that the motto can also be read as indicating uncertainty or modesty on Wittgenstein's part regarding the achievement of the philosophical investigations, both taken in itself and as it relates to the Tractatus. The motto could be read as an initial exercise in making sense of a sentence out of context, something which alerts the reader to ambiguity in context generally, and to this particular sentence's ambiguities specifically. And next, the motto warns us not to take what follows at face value, that we should be especially wary of the way in which we take the investigations to be progress. That's something I do discuss a bit. And finally, the motto can be read as introducing us to the use of voices other than Wittgenstein's own. These seem to me all perfectly reasonable ways of thinking about how the motto can be functioning. Baker and Hacker first note in their commentary in its original context, this is a quotation, in its original context, the motto expresses such negative views on progress as would harmonize with Wittgenstein's own repudiation of this aspect and this ideal of European culture. They immediately go on to speculate about what is clearly the main task of the motto. It remains, however, unclear what Nestroy's remark is intended to convey as a motto for the investigation. It might be suggested that it int intimates that the advance made in PI over the philosophy of TLP is less substantial than it appears. This is unlikely. More probable is the hypothesis that the intention behind the motto echoes the end of the preface to TLP. The value of this work is that it shows how little is achieved when these problems are solved. End of quote. Towards the end of this paper, I will return to some of the questions raised by this proposal. For now, I will simply mark a partial agreement with it by supposing it uncontroversial to believe that one natural way to understand the motto is to see Wittgenstein as using it to signal something about the way in which we understand the relation between the investigations and his first book, the Tractatus. This signal requires us to keep the Tractatus in mind as we are reading the investigations, something that we are encouraged to do in the preface where Wittgenstein writes, Four years ago, I had occasion to reread my first book, the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, and to explain its ideas to someone. It suddenly seemed to me that I should publish those old thoughts and the new ones together, that the latter could be seen in the right light only by contrast with and against the background of my old way of thinking. If one natural way to read the motto, then, is as some sort of expression of Wittgenstein's attitude to the way in which the investigations compares with the Tractatus, or more particularly as an expression of his attitude towards the way in which it may or may not constitute progress over the Tractatus, then two important and connected questions are, how did Wittgenstein conceive specifically of that progress, and how might we conceive specifically of that progress? I emphasize specifically here because while the words the main point about progress is that it always seems greater than it really is, suggests that Wittgenstein wants us to be careful about the way in which we understand the relation between the two books. It clearly does not give us much more to go on than that. In other words, the motto issues some kind of caution to us, but beyond that, we are left on our own to face some very large, large exegetical questions, questions we would, have to have, we would have had to deal with, with or without the motto. But at any rate, since it seems plausible to assume that Wittgenstein was concerned that the investigations, including its relation to the Tractatus, would be variously misunderstood, then the suggestion that the motto warns us to be wary of the way we take it to be progress seems to be especially appropriate. How we understand the question of the progress that the investigation makes beyond the Tractatus, and so how we conceive of their philosophical relation is not only complicated by the fact that each book is difficult taken on its own, it is made more complicated by the fact that our understanding of the one is often intertwined with our understanding of the other. For example, it can seem natural to read certain passages in the investigations as vigorously attacking a theory of meaning that Wittgenstein held in the Tractatus. In that case, one must ask about the nature and object of the attack. Does one, for instance, see the attack as consisting of Wittgenstein showing how a theory of meaning he now advocates is more adequate than his old theory of meaning?
Or does one instead see the, the investigations opposing a tractarian theory of meaning, not with a new theory of its own, but rather with a new method for dissolving philosophical problems, including problems left unsolved or even generated by his first book? Both of these are possibilities that have been explored a great deal over the last several decades, and they themselves comprise several subalternatives. Yet each of these possibilities shares the common assumption <clears throat> that one of the targets of the investigations is a theory of meaning that Wittgenstein espoused in the Tractatus. And this indicates at least one further alternative for understanding the progression of Wittgenstein's thought. And this entails dropping the assumption that there is an actual theory of meaning in the Tractatus to criticize in the first place. Dropping this assumption will usually go with a way of reading the Tractatus and the investigations on which neither book is intended as a piece of constructive or systematic philosophy, and on which the two books share substantially similar goals. And here's where I'm particularly borrowing on some of the work of people who are here. One way to characterize those goals is to say that each of these books aims to show the illusory nature of attempts to construct philosophical theories that require the reader to occupy an external vantage point on language. Another way to put this point is to say that both in the Tractatus and in the Investigations, Wittgenstein was concerned to show how emptiness in philosophy arises when philosophers, either explicitly or implicitly, imagine their work as presupposing nothing about human beings and their world. In addition, interpreters of Wittgenstein who tend to see the progress between his early and later work in this way tend also to think that to the extent that the goals of the two books do differ, this is more a reflection of a reflection of a significant change in Wittgenstein's understanding of philosophical method, not of a change in his theoretical or metaphysical ambitions. On this view, to the extent that the later Wittgenstein is critical of the Tractatus, and that he is, is something no one really doubts, such criticism is not directed in the first instance at the theories that the earlier book proffered, but rather at the conception of method it embodied and, in the end, at the way this method did, in fact, rely unknowingly, perhaps, on a sort of metaphysical theory. As this very general sketch may suggest, it is not my aim in this paper to catalog, let alone analyze and evaluate, the various positions and subpositions that comprise the debate concerning the continuity of Wittgenstein's thought. I shall simply state, therefore, that it is this last-mentioned alternative I find most compelling that my understanding of the question of progress between the Tractatus and the Investigations has therefore been largely shaped by those who have articulated this alternative, and that it is such an understanding of, of that progress that is taken for granted here, and that puts constraints on what I will say in the rest of the paper about a second way of thinking about the concept of progress of Wittgenstein's thought. Naturally, I hope my discussion of this second way will make this original assumption seem more plausible. But the plausibility of much I w of what I say in this regard will to some extent rest on the original assumption concerning the nature of the continuity of Wittgenstein's thought. And so the plausibility of what I say about each of the two ways for thinking about the concept of progress in his thought hangs together somewhat with what I say or assume about the other way. At any rate, for most of the rest of the paper, it will be the second way with which I will be dealing. It will be some time before I return to the continuity issue, the first way. Am I going too fast? There is little doubt among commentators today that the remarks on rule following and the investigations exhibit central features of the later Wittgenstein's treatment of meaning. For my purposes here, moreover, these remarks are well suited to bring out what I find to be one important consequence of the conception of philosophy that is ascribed to Wittgenstein in the last section. I will not, however, reconstruct or rehearse the arguments that take place in those remarks. Instead, I will rely for my orientation towards them on work carried out by some of the very same interpreters on whose work I rely for my overall understanding of the continuity and aim of Wittgenstein's philosophy. Indeed, since their work on the remarks on rule following has played an important role in the development of this overall understanding, this is not really a further assumption on my part, or at least not much of one. Especially since the publication of Saul Kripke's Wittgenstein on Rules in Private Language, 
The remarks on rule following have received considerable attention from many of the most capable philosophers writing on Wittgenstein. Most commentators take these remarks as giving an important expression to some version of a use theory of meaning that they take Wittgenstein to hold. The remarks are then seen as at once refuting certain deeply entrenched and widely held views about language, including some set of views that Wittgenstein is presumed to have held when he wrote the Tractatus, and as establishing Wittgenstein's own account of the ground of meaning, understanding, and normativity. Against this interpretive tendency to read the investigations as a constructive work of philosophy, Warren Goldfarb writes, the rule-following considerations are not meant to yield a conclusive refutation of one or another sophisticated philosophy of language. Rather, they operate by examining what frames the first steps of such a search for an account of meaning. And they are effective only insofar as what Wittgenstein provides is a convincing portrayal of how such a project comes to have a hold on us. A better understanding of, what, of Wittgenstein's position thus requires far more clarity than we currently have about the sources of the inchoate demands we put on the notion of meaning and about the role such demands play in philosophical theorizing. John McDowell seconds Goldfarb's idea. There is indeed room to complain that Wittgenstein reveals a need for something, but does not give it, or does not give enough of it. But what we might ask for, more of, is not a constructive account of how human interactions make meaning and understanding possible, but rather a diagnostic deconstruction of the peculiar way of thinking that makes such a thing seem necessary. This remark of McDowell's points to two related questions. What is the peculiar way of thinking? that we might want a diagnostic deconstruction of, and what is the significance of this way of thinking for our understanding of Wittgenstein's later philosophy. The source of the inchoate demands we put on the notion of meaning that Goldfarb, speak, that Goldfarb speaks of in the passage cited above is, I take it, something quite close to McDowell's peculiar way of thinking. And I want to make it plausible here to think that Wittgenstein's engagement with this peculiar way of thinking constitutes, in large measure, a philosophical response to what he takes to be one of the central organizing myths of modernity, what Charles Taylor has called the rationalist or disengaged view of human intelligence, or to paraphrase, paraphrase Stanley Cavell, the view that our fundamental relation to the world as a whole is one of knowing. Part of what I want to do here should be seen as an attempt to develop my own inflection on what I take to be Cavell's suggestion that the philosophical investigations is a book whose cultural teaching is internal to its structure and not a text in which we should necessarily expect to find its philosophy of culture expressed in cultural remarks per se. Cavell, Cavell writes in this vein, <coughs> since I have in effect claimed that there is a perspective from which the philosophical investigations may be seen as presenting a philosophy of culture, I have implied that its attitude to its time is directly pre presented in it, as directly as, say, in Spangler, or as in Freud, or Nietzsche, or Emerson. Then the difficulty in articulating the difficulty of Wittgenstein's attitude is the difficulty of finding this perspective. Now here I'm going to read, this is about the longest footnote I'm going to, I'm going to read. As part of his own working out of some of the issues I focus on here, Cavell devotes considerable attention to the ways in which he sees the style and form of the investigations cohering and being part of the cohering with and being part of the expression of its philosophy of culture as well as its overall philosophical message. Cavell reads the avowed lack of grand theoretical ambitions, the poverty, he would perhaps say the modernism of the investigations, as connecting up with its ambivalence about taking a stand on philosophical questions whose contents are unclear this being part of the modern predicament of the inheritability of those questions. This very reticence on Wittgenstein's part, then, is read by Cavell as an important part of the book's philosophy of culture. To see some differences and similarities with my own approach here, it is worth comparing Cavell's idea of the text of the philosophical investigations presenting us with a philosophy of culture with Jacques Bouveresse's work. Bouveresse makes a sharp distinction between Wittgenstein, the cultural thinker, and Wittgenstein, the philosopher, who produces clean, objective results, as he says. And so, finding no cultural remarks per se in, for example, the investigations, he proceeds as though Wittgenstein's cultural outlook is essentially absent from the text. 
While it's true that Bouveres does not explicitly reject Cabell's idea that a philosophy of culture might somehow be presented in the text of the investigations, his practice, in effect, urges us to do just that. To this end, except for a brief discussion of the original context of the motto, Bouveres remains entirely outside Wittgenstein's philosophical texts for his discussion of his cultural thought. Furthermore, like Cavell, and unlike me, there is little or no explanation in Bouveres of the possibility that Wittgenstein's philosophical texts and those texts where cultural topics are more explicitly taken up may shed light on one another. A further point of intersection between Cavell and Bouveres can be found in the latter's claims that Wittgenstein's philosophical texts are written so as to be in tune with what he perceived to be the barrenness of the times and that this accounts in large measure for why we do not find direct expression of his cultural views in those texts. Yet unlike Cavell, Bouveres doesn't explore whether the barrenness of the writing <coughs> itself can have any cultural force or whether that barrenness can be connected to or somehow be a direct expression of those cultural views. Nor does he explore the question of what the attraction or point of, point of philosophy would be for a man like Wittgenstein if he really thought that there was no way in which his work could somehow be connected with the topics addressed, say, in culture and value. Interestingly, Bouveres claims at one point that Wittgenstein would have preferred to have practiced in an age where he could have produced, quote, something more grandiose. Taken to mean that Wittgenstein harbored a wish to live at a time when it would have made sense to be a philosophical theoretician or system builder, and connected with Bouveres' sense that the nature of Wittgenstein's text merely reflects his desire to produce clean, objective results, one can perhaps begin to recognize an obstacle to Bouveres' envisaging the possibility that the investigations may be intended to function in the service of what could properly be called Wittgenstein's philosophy of culture. What I want to do now is to articulate a way in which I find the remarks on rule following to give expression to the kind of perspective Cavell says we need to locate. In particular, I want to count as part of the investigation's cultural teaching, a perspective on ourselves with which Wittgenstein is trying to leave us vis-a-vis -vis our relation to features of our culture, such as the disengaged view in philosophy, and to what he took to be its connection to that culture's dominant conception of progress. Now, perhaps the main intellectual requirement that the disengaged picture in philosophy makes on us is that we must envisage for ourselves a way to account for the rationality manifest in our various activities that is completely independent of those activities themselves. In the particular case of following an arithmetical rule, the disengaged view requires us to imagine ourselves to be in possession of something that would satisfy the requirement that our understanding transcend all of our actual responses when we write out a numerical series. More specifically, we imagine that our understanding of the rule must be conceptually independent, both of those responses that we have previously accepted as being in accord with the rule and of all further possible moves we could give. When we are beholden to the requirement forced on us by the disengaged picture, acknowledging the conceptual dependence of our understanding of the rule and our actions, will at best seem like a compromise that practical necessity extracts from us. It will not appear to be to us to be in accord with rationality per se. As Taylor notes, the reason for this is that the disengaged intellectualist picture forces us into a corner. He writes, intellectualism leaves us only with the choice between an understanding that consists of representations and no understanding at all. Many commentators writing on Wittgenstein have pinpointed this requirement as one of the central targets in the remarks on rule following. Goldfarb writes, the demand, however, is for a fixing of the correct continuation that does not rely upon us or take for granted anything about us at all. What Wittgenstein principally wants to suggest is that we do not have any real conception of what this comes to. We have, as Wittgenstein is wont to say, no model of it. McDowell echoes Goldfarb. The idea that the rules of a practice mark out rails traceable independently of the reactions of the participants is suspect even in this apparently ideal case of a numerical series. An insistence that wherever there is going on in the same way, there must be rules that can be conceived as marking out such independently traceable rails involves a misconception of the sort of case in which correctness within a practice 
can be given the kind of demonstration we count as proof. Taylor's way of making this point is, I think, even better, since it explicitly calls our attention to the embeddedness of the rule in the practice. The reciprocity between the rule and the practice it guides is what the intellectualist disengaged picture leaves out. In fact, what it shows is that the rule lies essentially in the practice. The rule is what is animating the practice at any time and not some formulation behind it inscribed in our thoughts or our brains or our genes or whatever. That's why the rule is at any given time what the practice has made of it. Taylor goes on to indicate <clears throat> where I think is the right place to look so as to avoid getting trapped at all, where I believe Wittgenstein too is trying to point us towards. He writes, embodied understanding provides us with the third alternative we, may, we need to make sense of ourselves. It is our ignoring of what Taylor call, here calls embodied understanding that Wittgenstein thinks accounts for the way the requirement that rationality be understood independently of all of our activities gets a foothold in philosophy in the first place. Of course, it is not that Taylor's point about the significance of embodied understanding is utterly missed by commentators. But the usual way of taking it is to mistake the space Wittgenstein makes in his writing for the notion of embodied understanding and practice for an attempt to give a constructive theory of meaning. This is an, inter an interpretive tendency that McDowell is keen to counter. He writes, readers of Wittgenstein often suppose that when he mentions customs, forms of life, and the like, he is making programmatic gestures towards a certain style of positive philosophy, one that purports to make room for talk of meaning and understanding in the face of supposedly genuine obstacles by locating such talk in a context of human interactions conceived as describable otherwise than in terms of meaning or understanding. But there is no reason to credit Wittgenstein with any sympathy for this style of philosophy. When he says, quote, what has to be accepted that the given is, so one could say, forms of life, his point is not to adumbrate a philosophical response on such lines to supposedly good questions about the possibility of meaning and understanding or intentionality generally, but to remind us of something we can, take, we can take in the proper way only after we are equipped to see that such questions are based on a mistake. His point is to remind us that the natural phenomenon that is normal human life is itself already shaped by meaning and understanding. McDowell is not alone in arguing for the inadequacies of interpretations of Wittgenstein, which attribute to him constructive ambitions. In his well-known behaviorist interpretation of the remarks on rule following, Saul Kripke finds Wittgenstein providing an ersatz account of meaning in terms of assertion conditions. Cora Diamond has criticized the way Kripke would have us understand Wittgenstein as providing an explanation of the meaning of the words agreement, correctness, mistake, etc., in abstraction from the particular roles those words have in our lives. Yet Diamond also warns us that even in our rejection of an overtly constructivist interpretation, such as Kripke's, we need to be careful lest we fall into the same trap. She writes, how then does the contrast with Kripke's account in terms of assertion conditions go with Wittgenstein's approach? Here is how not to put it. He says that meaning is given not by assertion conditions, but by place in life. Rather, he thinks that when we raise philosophical questions about meaning, we are, for various reasons, inclined not to attend to the place words have in our lives, to the very particular places. To give an account of meaning in terms of assertion conditions is to remain with our eyes fixed in the wrong direction. If we fix our eyes in the direction that Diamond takes Wittgenstein to be trying to lead us, that is, to the surface level of our actual use of words, we get a quite different picture, she writes. In fact, of course, we are not just trained to go 446, 448, 450, etc., and other similar things. We are brought into a life in which we rest on, depend on, people's following rules of many sorts, and in which people depend on us. Rules and agreement in following them, and reliance on agreement in following them, and criticizing or rounding on people who do not do it right, all this is woven into the texture of life. And it is the co in the context of its having a place in such a form of human life that a mistake is recognizably that. These are words no less true of Wittgenstein's use of the words custom, practice, and other expressions. For McDowell, 
Diamond and other for McDowell Diamond and other like-minded readers of Wittgenstein, we need to hear those words too, as spoken from within the context of a form of human life that is already shaped by meaning and understanding. McDowell indicates what I take to be the right view of where Wittgenstein hopes the remarks on rule following, and indeed, in my opinion, his later philosophy more generally, will leave his reader. Given a satisfying di this is a quote. Given a satisfying diagnosis, the inclination to answer a philosophical question about meaning should evaporate, and the question should simply fall away. There is no need to concoct substantial philosophical answers to them. The right response to how is meaning possible, or how is intentionality possible, is to uncover the way of thinking that makes it seem difficult to accommodate meaning and intentionality in our picture of how things are, and to lay bare how uncompulsory it is to think that way. In coming to see the requirements that the disengaged view imposes on us, as uncompulsory, of course, we can come to see it for what it is, a picture that extracts commitments from us, and perhaps more importantly, blocks us from seeing others, blocks us in philosophy from examining the rags that Wittgenstein speaks of in 52 in the investigation. But in addition to learning to let go of certain philosophical questions and learning to allow the inclination to ask them to evaporate, we can also be led to ask different questions, not merely about the effects of the disengaged picture, but about the sources it has in our lives, about what commitments on our part make it seem so compulsory. These questions may not strike us as immediately philosophical in themselves, but I believe that they are among the most important questions that Wittgenstein's philosophy is intended to bring us to ask. I believe that these considerations I believe that these considerations give us good reason for thinking that it would be a mistake to see Wittgenstein as a writer whose sole or primary goal in philosophy was the dissolution of philosophical puzzles concerning the meaning of words. As I have already argued, his attempt to bring out the incoherence of the disengaged picture is of a piece with an attempt to bring out the way our rule-following practices are, as Diamond puts it, woven into the texture of life. But if understanding Wittgenstein's remarks on rule following requires that we really look to see how our rule following practices are woven into the texture of our life with others, then it must also be true that integral to these and other related remarks is the hope that as we let go of the disengaged picture, we will come to have a transformed understanding of ourselves, of the kind of creatures that we are. We are supposed to see our rule-following practices as making sense within specific contexts of a form of life. But to talk of practice, custom, and form of life in this way can, moreover, immediately invoke other words, such as history and culture. To become aware of ourselves as embodying practices is, if not ipso facto, one way to become aware of ourselves as finite creatures who are embedded in a particular historical and cultural setting. This brings new questions with it. What did Wittgenstein think about the relation between the kinds of philosophical questions that arise from the disengaged view of ourselves, questions which in his eyes bear an intimate relation to our overlooking the role of embodied understanding in our lives, and the historical cultural setting we discover ourselves in when this role becomes clearer to us? If becoming aware of our finitude is as closely tied to the dissipation of philosophical confusion as I am suggesting it is for Wittgenstein, then it stands to reason that bringing this to light was an important aim of his writing. Taylor connects the dominance of the disengaged view in philosophy with, quote, the hegemony of bureaucratic technical reason in our lives. I believe Wittgenstein would agree with Taylor that the disengaged view of ourselves is not only endemic to philosophy, but is also what I above called one of the central organizing myths of modernity. And accordingly, I take this way of taking the rule-following remarks in the investigations as one place that call into question the way in which this view finds its expression in philosophy, as in turn providing support for the claim that Wittgenstein was a philosopher of culture. If this is true, and if I am right, also right in believing that the remarks on rule-following occupy a central place in Wittgenstein's later writings, then it becomes very plausible to claim that Wittgenstein's cultural concerns should figure as an important framework within which we engage those remarks. I said earlier 
<clears throat> that part of the point of this paper is to show how it broadens our understand perspective on the nature of Wittgenstein's philosophy when we see that two ways of thinking about the concept of progress in his thought are actually woven together in his work. In part one, I discussed one way for thinking about the concept of progress that has been relevant here. In that way, progress between the early and later Wittgenstein is not marked out by a more successful achievement of constructed philosophical ambitions, but rather by a way of doing philosophy that more successfully deconstructs those ambitions, better shows up such ambitions to make philosophical progress as empty. Here I have been trying to bring out the way Wittgenstein's deconstruction of the disengaged view in the remarks on rule following represents an engagement with the concept of progress in a different sense. We can see this if we can see that the disengaged view in philosophy is one reflection of the same sort of mythological demand on, ra on rationality that often characterizes our culture's commitments to progress in science, mathematics, technology, politics, and morals. We find these two ways of thinking for thinking about progress in Wittgenstein's thought woven together by Wittgenstein himself in the following excerpt from a sketch for a forward to philosophical remarks. It is all one to me whether the typical Western scientist understands or appreciates my work, since in any case, he does not understand the spirit in which I write. Our civilization is characterized by the word progress. Progress is its form. It is not one of its properties that it makes progress. Typically, it constructs. Its activity is to construct a more and more complicated structure. And even clarity is only a means to this end and not an end in itself. For me, on the contrary, clarity, transparency, is an end in itself. I am not interested in erecting a building, but in having the foundations of possible buildings transparently before me. So I am aiming at something different than other scientists, and my way of thoughts, are, and my way of thoughts move differently than do theirs. This passage is not, however, the only place where I want to say that Wittgenstein allows the word progress to refer simultaneously to the two senses of progress that account for the ambiguity in the title of this paper. I believe we also find the word progress doing double duty, as it were, in the model of the investigations, a place that must be thought of as a highly significant point in Wittgenstein's authorship. Returning then to the motto, recall that in picking up, an earlier, picking up earlier on an idea by Baker and Hacker, I indicated my sense that the motto is intended to convey to the reader a need for caution when reading the investigations against the background of the Tractatus. And I went on to try to make clear at the outset how I understand that need in light of my own interpretive commitments. We saw, however, that while Baker and Hacker do make brief note of the motto's original context, a scene in Nestroy's play where a wide-eyed belief in historical progress is clearly being ridiculed, rather than exploring this direction, they immediately go on to assert it remains, however, unclear what Nestroy's remark is intended to convey as a motto for the investigations. One wants to say to this that, of course, there are questions about the relevance of the motto for our understanding of the investigations, including, however, questions about the significance of that original context. The brevity with which Baker and Hacker pass over that original context, however, betrays a conviction that it has little or nothing to contribute to, the, to that understanding as though the fact that the motto refers us to such a context were, so to speak, merely decorative. And this effectively excludes the very possibility that in citing the words of an important Austrian dramatist and cultural critic, Wittgenstein may be signaling an idea that I have been trying to make plausible here on somewhat independent grounds, that what the author of the philosophical investigations thought about what he calls in the preface the darkness of these times including what he thought about the concept of progress in a cultural historical sense, was internally related to how he conceived of his own work, in its composition, method, and style, in its relation to his earlier work, in the sort of transformation he hoped it might facilitate in those who read it, and in particular, perhaps, in the transformation of their thinking about progress, and, of course, in light of the fact that he felt the work to have been written in a time where hardly anyone felt the need or saw the point of such a transformation. The two issues, the two missing sections, part three and part four, that I have, am working on but have not written really, take up two further issues, uh, two big sets of issues, and I want to talk about just two specific aspects of them each here. Uh, 
The first is the question of conservatism. Um, this is very, I mean, Baker and Hacker's um, interpretation of the motto seems to, to buy into a, um, a general impression people often have that, well, this is just one more example of Wittgenstein's reactionary thought. And they take the motto itself, I think, to be an expression of some kind of conservatism. Recall they wrote, in its original context, it expresses such negative views on progress as would harmonize with Wittgenstein's own repudiation of this aspect and this ideal of European culture. It is difficult to tell for sure, but if, as the wording here, along with the lack of discussion, leads me to suspect, their idea is that we can take for granted that the motto is an expression of Wittgenstein's endorsement of the reactionary views he founds espoused in Nestroy's play. In that case, I would want to distance myself from that idea for two reasons. The first reason, about which I'll have more to say later in the paper, but not today, is that there is no basis for ascribing that kind of conservatism to Wittgenstein. If, as I take to be the case, the ideal of European and American culture that he repudiates is a metaphysical conception of progress. The second reason is that Nestroy himself was no reactionary. Indeed, he was highly critical of the pre-1848 ruling powers. Moreover, it was not just any conception of progress that an Austrian satirist of this time could be expected to be ridiculing, but rather a metaphysically charged one emanating from an increasingly domineering and self-confident Prussia. And I have help from there from Herbert Rockovic and Walter Sokell on that on those last ideas. So in the spirit of the idea that the investigation aims to return us from the metaphysical uses of words to their ordinary uses, there's nothing, there's no reason to think that after we're done reading the investigations that there's not a good, robust, ordinary sense of progress and decline, as it were, that is not available to us for the purposes of political or criti uh, moral or cultural criticism. It's, um, so, so this, this idea that, um, that Wittgenstein's hostility to this notion of progress is, hostil is, a, is a hostility to every way of using that word progress, some kind of rarefied way of using it, is I, think, is, I think, pretty baseless. And then the last thing I would like to say concerns this issue, again, of what I would like to come back to at the very end of the paper. Um, how are we going to conceive, in a cultural sense, whether the investigations, as a, as a, as a work of cultural philosophy, makes progress over the, uh, over the Tractatus? And I, I want to pick up there on something uh, Cora Diamond says. I think at the very end of her paper, Ethics, Imagination, and the Method of the Tractatus, where she talks about a discussion Wittgenstein was having about the um, Rumpelstiltskin with uh, Fanny Pascal. Uh, and she relates the story as Pascal, she repeats the story as Pascal has related it, where Wittgenstein thought, thought that Rumpelstiltskin's last sentence of the play, Wie gut das keiner weiß, dass ich Rumpelstiltskin heißt, something like that. And he thought this was very deep. And Diamond goes on to discuss that this may seem to be another expression of Wittgenstein's being out of tune with the times. This is all, mind you, in a, in a paper on the ethics of the Tractatus. So at any rate, she in indicates some ideas there that, that began to um, percolate in my head, uh, leading me to think that, in some sense, I think the Tractatus also, as Cavell's talking about the investigations directly presenting what I've called having internal to it a philosophy of culture, I began thinking about the possibility of looking at the Tractatus as a work that, in a sense, internalizes or directly presents us with a philosophy of culture. And then one way of seeing the progress over the, of the investigations over the Tractatus begins to, to be, uh, involve looking at why the investigation, uh, sorry, the Tractatus is a work that even if it wishes to embody or have internal to it, a philosophy of culture doesn't manage quite to pull that off. 